this moment in time, I really think you can't speak about racism without also simultaneously speaking about the gendered structure of racism. So in other words, that race and sex and gender are always being defined at the same time and for particular political reasons. So in other words, if we go back to something I said earlier on, that we always start with the body, that any body that is being defined racially is already either a male or a female or in process kind of body in terms of sex and gender. So, but what I am going to do for just a few moments is to take the concept of race and racism and um, explain to you a little bit about what that means um, both in the United States but also I think globally today. Now, the book that I wrote, Racism, um, well, it was called Hatreds and then uh, writing racism and uh, sexism through the, the wars at that time. You know, that's over a decade ago. What I think is particularly interesting in this moment is that in the newer writing that I have done, I moved from thinking that racism was a helpful enough concept to saying that usually when the term racism is being used, what really is meant is uh, white privilege or white domination. So that particularly when it is said that the West is racist, it's that it is white privileged and that it privileges whiteness against and it's important to really articulate that, that statement of against, against other colors being given new meanings. And the meanings that they are given is in relationship to the standard of whiteness. Now, of course, being white also, I think, requires something of me in being more responsible about naming what is a normalized and standardized notion of privileging from the white standard. So the, the issue today in the US, the incredible violence that is being wrought on black bodies, that's a process of defining racism in new meanings. So historically, in the US, the, the writing was done, the, the writing on black bodies was done in chattel slavery, which was, had a more homogenized meaning of what it meant to be black. To be black meant to be a slave. It was more in terms of what the caste structure is in India um, in terms of a hierarchy that exists um, and is normalized through a concept of inevitability. So today, racism in the US is much more complicated because you are allowed opportunity within the structure of racism. So the idea here is not every black body is the same. Some black bodies have been able to take advantage of opportunities and seem to have moved beyond racism. But one of the huge conflicts is over whether the structure of racism is ever left behind, no matter how privileged you become as black. So we have um, certain ideas and statements to try to reveal this in terms of anti-racist politics that says 
no matter how rich you are as a black person, you can get stopped while driving. In other words, being black is enough reason to stop you. No matter how rich you are, it will actually sometimes be problematic. The more expensive car you are in as a black person, the greater the risk that you will be stopped. Some of the people I work with who are upper middle class blacks just drive the most beat up car that they can find and they find they have more freedom that way than calling attention to themselves as it's not my car, I've stolen it. So the name Sa Sandra Bland, do you, did that come here? So the idea that Sandra Bland is stopped and she is stopped because, you know, this would be a, a real riot in Hyderabad, right? She moved from one lane to another without her blinker. You don't even have lanes here, right? And so this could not happen. But in the United States, this was great cause to have her stopped. So normally, to be honest, people move from one lane to another all the time. But this was reason enough for this police person to stop her and then to drag her out of her car when she asked just the simple question, as though she were a white woman, what have I done? Why are you stopping me? This enraged the policeman. He pulls her out. And then, in short order, she is arrested. Now, even for most Americans, whether you are racist or not, that seemed a little excessive, all right? But then, again, given the inequity of our country, she, uh, she was arrested and bail was set. She did not have the money for her bail. She was then put in a jail cell the next morning, found dead. Now, it was said that she um, hanged herself, and there has been lots of controversy over exactly who was responsible, whether she did hang herself or not. But Sandra Bland, I have several t-shirts with her name on them, and it is to try to make visible that a black woman driving a car was dead 24 hours later, and that this is a statement that you can't say that no matter how many rich people you have, no matter the fact that you have a black president, of the United States that racism still exists. In other words, that there is a structure here, similar to what I think any Dalit would say, there is a structure that you come up against no matter who you are as an individual, and that no matter what you can do, that structural system, which means the system that already says to the world who you are, before you have a moment to say who you are. That's what structural racism is about. But the discussion right now, and I think that this is a global conversation as well, is that the more you have the mixing and the diversity of colors and races within the ruling class of the world, that then you say that racism no longer exists. But the question here is what is the relationship between individuals and structures of power when it comes to the issue here of racial oppression and racial structure, uh, racial exploitation, ra racialized opportunity. The concern here is to have us understand, I think, that although racism is always color-coded, there is nothing natural about it. Nothing natural about it. And uh, some people want to say there's a little bit natural about it because there is something that they would say has a biological essentialism that is rooted in color. 
And I would argue that color has no inherent meaning. It is always given its meaning historically, economically, contextually, and that therefore it is always changeable as well. So that what seems as though it cannot be changed is actually quite changeable and that you can reinvent and restructure and revolutionize systems of caste and race and gender and sex always because of what is really a constructed notion of meaning. So the idea here, um, kind of the tension between what sometimes is called biological essentialism, which is used in terms of race and in terms of sex, in terms of gender, and the idea of constructionism, that the meaning of what is essential always is done within a context, and that that context usually defines the reason and the purpose for any particular definition of, of racism. The notion here is that racism, racism then, it, it is a practice of othering, and the othering re requires a notion of separation and distance. And that in terms of the, the history that the U.S. has come to be known and through and expressed, it is towards blacks, to create blacks primarily as the other, as the dehumanized, or not human. So in so much of the Black Lives Matter campaign, the struggle is to say that black, what does it mean to say black lives matter? I mean, who needs to know that black lives matter? If you're black, you know your life matters, right? So the argument here is to say what? That we, we should matter to everyone, you know, and without mattering to everyone, we cannot have our rights or um, as was said in so many of the struggles, we cannot breathe, all right? Now, Franz Fanon also said, why did we revolt? We revolted because, and this is a direct quote from Wretched of the Earth, we cannot breathe. So the idea even that the same language is being used, just again, the embodiment of the human being. If you cannot breathe, you cannot live. So, all right, now again, one of the big arguments um, in the US was, what do you mean black lives matter? All lives matter. And that was said by some blacks, and it was said by many whites who felt as though Black Lives Matter was an exclusionary statement, all right? So that just takes us back to some of what I talked to you about before. I'm arguing, black, if you say Black Lives Matter, that means for the first time in the United States, what? All lives matter because we've always said all lives matter at the same time that what? Black lives have not mattered. So, you know, what might have felt very theoretical or abstract to you when I first said to you, flip it. The more specific you are, the more universal and inclusive. What is so interesting is from on the ground, from you know, just in the heart of the demonstrations in our country comes what? The specified idea that Black Lives Matter, and of course every one of these people that I have worked with means with that, that yes, if our lives matter, everyone's life will matter. But again, the, they have rejected as racist the reaction to Black Lives Matter all lives matter, okay? So, I mean, that's just a very specific out of everyday political life struggle, you know, this, this very big and deep intellectual idea of saying what? That the history that, that we have made is really an exclusionary history 
that operates as though democracy is for everyone when it is only for those who are wealthy enough with the right color, with the right gender, etc. So in, this, in the same way, the, the liberal democratic human rights language, what again, I think we all need to be asking ourselves is, so what have the last decades been about? It's just trying to make that a real statement by bringing in everyone who has been excluded. But at some point, you really do have to ask yourself, okay, so everyone gets in, but is it in the a kind of structure that really will allow democracy? Right now, people say, you wanted Obama, you got Obama, and you will pay for getting Obama. So in other words, he got elected in 2008, and we have had a more murderous state uh, and, and really move to a police state towards blacks. So the idea here again is what is the relationship of certain kinds of reforms without certain kinds of commitments to really re restructure the structuring of racism. All right. And um, I mean, we're not even going to the globe right now where does it matter that the president isn't white and is black as we continue to support Saudi Arabia and the war in Yemen and the wars in Syria and pretend like we're still not in the longest war we've ever been in in Afghanistan. So again, the question of of color and race and power and structure and democracy. These are, these are all the, the big issues of um, very, what, the history of colonialism and the way it's been threaded into the history of imperialism. And again, the latest statement of imperialism where you don't really have the tension of nation um, in the way that you did at one time for global capital, and now you have what's called globalization, all right? Of course, the slave trade was global. The United States had a global economy from the get-go. So the idea now of the new globalization and how it is in, inherent in a structuring that hasn't ever fully gotten rid of the system of colonialism, the system of caste, the system of class, the systems, structures of um, remain, remain at issue. One has to ask the question, so is so much of the conflict that we see at the moment and so much of the aggressiveness of US empire, is that because when we move fully consciously to a discussion of the global economy, that white privilege makes absolutely no sense because whites are a minority, and that is the racial new set of meanings and struggles. Will this be part of the, the newest restructuring of the meaning of race? What is going to happen? to these different systems um, that today have been differentiated enough so we can say that instead of having a white structure of power in the United States, that we have a diverse one, all right? Now, the, the discussion here of diversity and what does it mean to diversify those in positions of power, this is asking a significant question. What does it mean if the structurings of class, gender, sex, caste, if those structurings remain even in new modernized fashion, what does it mean to have a, a, a rainbow of colors? So is that, is that, is that really a different structure 
is it a different structure of racism? Is it not racism? Or is it a new formulation that is a, mer a more diversified racism? Okay, in that same way, a diversified gendering and even a diversification of the meaning of class. Now again, I know some of you don't like it when I just keep asking questions, but I got just one more that is totally just coming out of these kinds of issues, which is, is actually economic class, is that the least changing of all of these other structures that embed in each other. And what I mean by least changing is least open to universalization. In other words, that no, we will not share the wealth. We will share the coloring. We will share the gendering. Because we do seem to be doing that already, and yet the concentration of wealth has grown. It has not become a more open system, although more people clearly have had a chance to improve their lives. All right. Which again brings us to the question of the growing middle class in many countries that used to not have a middle class. Is that middle class bringing about more of a democracy? Now this is some, maybe this is something that India and China can learn from the United States. The coming of our middle class really did mean a democratization that now has been lost. The democratization that came through the, the opening of our class structure, allowing a growing middle class through the 50s, 60s, early 70s, that has really stopped it is the shrinking of the middle class in the United States that is the support system for Donald Trump. So the idea here again of, uh, I, I think there are just moving levers everywhere and I think that racism is a, uh, a structural lever that is, um, is both stuck and is really changing rapidly. And it's the relationship between those that then has me asking, so brown and black and people of other colors being threaded through colonialism and capitalism, imperialism and globalization, then what will be the new narratives that go with this new diversity? I think it will silence the concept of hatred at the very same time that some of the practices of hatred will continue and that that is part of the, the, the new structuring. I also think it's important to recognize that the language itself makes it very hard to have these conversations, just like I've said all along. For feminists, um, the term women of color the term people of color, it um, always has pro been problematic for anti-racist feminists. Because why? Because white is a color. So the idea here that we talk about people of color that are not white as though white then becomes what? An invisible statement of power and privilege. So. Um, Actually, in the 2008 election, uh, when, when I decided for the first time ever to be um, someone working in electoral politics, um, because I did think it would matter that Obama, Obama would be elected. I thought that it was an important moment in anti-racist politics um, that although as a Marxist I always had argued that it does not matter who runs the state, what we want is not to have an oppressive state. I was convinced that we didn't know enough about racism to know if we did elect a black president, could we really start to shift the system of racism in the U.S.? Because I was committed to that more than I was 
committed to electing a woman, and a white woman at that, who had been protective of a state that I was not interested in uh, really um, supporting, at great uh, personal agony, because I was greatly um, criticized as a feminist for not supporting Hillary Clinton in 2008 and supporting uh, Barack Obama. And as a Marxist, I was pilloried for thinking that it mattered who would be elected. So talk about just really feeling alone. 2008 was a tough year for me, all right? No Marxists were talking to me, most of the feminists weren't talking to me, and I wrote a piece called Hillary is White. Okay, so the point here was everyone is talking about Obama as black, and everyone was talking about Hillary as a woman. All right, and my point, she's white. Okay? So that, and I thought that was really what needed to be understood. So what I'm trying to, to really share with you in a way that I, I haven't done publicly much is here we are at another electoral moment. Um, and to me, this one is worse than 2008 for sure. So the idea here, though, of what does racism mean in the world that we occupy, um, and if we just play it out on the biggest stage and in the most intimate ways that Black Lives Matter is, um, is making uh, you know, such a statement at the moment that they will not um, become involved in the electoral moment of, of Trump. They will not endorse any candidate, but that most of them, many of them have said, we must see that Trump does not win. Alicia Garza says, there really is no candidate here that we can trust to fight racism, nor that we can really trust to fight sexism as it punishes people of color. So what she says is that people must just be using all their energy to be ready for whoever gets elected. Okay, so, but what, when, when we try to think about what does racism mean in this moment, it seems to me that um, Alicia Garza's statement does really speak to the fact that there is a structure of power here that is racist that gives people of color, particularly for her as a black trans woman, um, not a whole lot of, of choice in terms of really embracing a democratic politics other than what? Black Lives Matter, to be out in the streets at every moment trying to make clear that white supremacy, white domination, and white privilege has to end, that that is at the center, although she argues that simultaneously issues of gender must always uh, be recognized and, and understood. Okay, so I also think the system of racism, that it would be true in terms of both caste and class, is about separation and segregation. And the idea here of a segre uh, segregated spaces, separate spaces, um, in the history of the civil rights movement in the United States, it was to try to break down the separateness, to create the possibility of integration, of shared spaces. I think that um, today, at this moment, there is more and more questioning about um, the meanings of possibility here, and then what the outcomes, what the real outcomes are in these, in these kinds of moments.
All right. Now, in, uh, in, in a lot of the politics of Black Lives Matter, they have been showing the way that the Jim Crow era, all right, and now some of the Say Her Name activists say, Jim Crow was also Jane Crow. So we need, we need to recognize that the criminalization of black bodies happens to both male and female people of color, although much of that criminalization happens differently according to gender. But what we need are new specifics, new understandings. And um, so do, do you all use Netflix? Is Netflix something here? Yeah? So there's a new documentary out by um, a, a woman named Ava DeVernay. She actually was the director of the film Selma. Have some of you seen that? Okay. So it's just come out about a week and a half ago, and this is called 13th. And 13th is for the 13th Amendment, the ending of uh, chattel slavery and the right to citizenry. Um, unless, there is just this little phrase in our Constitution, unless you have been arrested. So, of course, the 13th Amendment really now is being uncovered in the kind of way that our, the history of the United States, the way that black bodies have been criminalized through the ending of, of slavery, through the Jim and Jane Crow era, into the present Black Lives Matter period. And it really shows the growing of the racist carceral state that the, that the U.S. is. And it is a brilliant documentary. It will um, just, you know, for people in and outside the United States, it just tells an incredible story of the racialization and the racism that is so necessary uh, to, the, to the system as it continues to exist today, um, showing very much that what the so-called period of integration and period of Jim Crow new laws to try to deal with that, that now really we have in the U.S., we have as many uh, black men and women in uh, our prisons as were slaves historically. It really argues that incarceration is the new slavery in the U.S. and in including the use of slave labor in um, prisons. So the idea again of the historical definition of racism and uh, the way that it gets threaded and rethreaded for new moments, new meanings, um, is just really extraordinarily important. So again, to just flip it one other different way here, um, Michelle Obama gave a talk in, in the U.S. about four, four, four or five nights ago. I don't know if maybe some of you have seen it on Facebook or it's just gotten, it's really gone viral. And ha have you seen it? Yeah. So she's got an enormous support for it, you know, just saying that she really is able to stand against the uh, sexual violence that uh, Trump is representing, and she speaks just openly and hostily against Donald Trump. So last night, I was sent by some of the black women I work with a statement, and it says in the statement, Michelle Obama, why do you never speak for us? Okay, and what this piece, what they're saying to, to her is that you, you know, uh, Trump spoke against Mexicans. He spoke against uh, all immigrants. He has spoken with hatred towards black people. He has said that what we need to do is reinstate stop and frisk, which is one of the most racist policies that our police have ever used. And New York uh, made it unconstitutional and illegal. He is calling, if he becomes president, he will do stop and frisk. In other words, 
you, you, as a police officer, you do not need a reason. You can stop anyone, frisk them, tell them to drop their pants, whatever, if you have a thought that they may have a gun. In the United States, it's quite possible that anyone does. So the idea here, though, is it has put black people, Latina people at great risk. And so this was a huge struggle. So they say, when, when, he, when he said he was going to do this, how come you did not get out there and speak on our behalf? When he finally starts talking about white women's bodies in a certain way, that's when you say, this really enrages me. So these black women say, we are feminists and we are against sexual violence. We just want to know, why can't you speak for all of us as opposed to speaking as though um, they feel as though she is a white woman? Okay, so the idea here, again, is not that there is only one way to speak, but that what we have to do is name the specifics. Why not, Michelle, say, Black Lives Matter? That's why, Trump, we will not stand for you doing what you are doing, all right? Not to mention my other point, which um, I had already said in criticism of Michelle's statement, which is, Donald Trump is only the symptom of a structural problem. So we don't want to overstate him as the problem because even if he is not elected, we have a huge problem of structural racism and structural misogyny in the United States that no matter who gets elected will have to be addressed. All right, so again, what I've been doing is just going in and out of both the theoretical and the practical to try to just talk about this particular moment, um, understanding some of the latest ideas. So I also, you know, I said to you that um, language, you know, can help us see things. And one of my favorite new terms of the last couple of years is the term massage, massage noir. Okay, so putting together misogyny and blackness. And the woman who put this word out there is Moya Bailey, a black woman who says that for her, it, the problem is never just misogyny, it is just never racism, it is massage noir. All right. So again, the idea of looking for language that allows you to see things structurally and, uh, and demand a change. So I just thought I would close with this idea and, um, and then we could just see what you want to talk more about, okay? And that is that um, uh, in, in May, just about, a year ago, um, I was asked to talk about and, and write a piece about feminism at this moment. What kind of feminism did I think made sense? And so um, I decided to call this feminism an abolitionist feminism. One that, in, uh, again, growing up, coming out of my life in the United States, that I am an abolitionist, which means clearly that I am against racism and I am a feminist, and that the idea that also that what we must do is abolish rather than just reform, even if the reforms are taken on a daily basis, which clearly I've done, in order to try to find an abolitionism. Okay. Now, it seems to me as well, in terms of the caste system, and, um, and I know we, we have this conversation coming up later, the, the question um, of really, is, is it possible to reform the caste system any more than it is possible to reform 
racism. And, um, and in uh, Arundhati Roy's introduction to the Ambedkar's, um, what's the name of his? his? Yes, right. The, you know, I, I just loved the clarity that he had and she takes from him in the necessity of saying that this is, that this is not a possible ref reforming, that it, it must be restructured and, and abolished in, uh, in order to find a, a, a new construction for democracy. So um, I thought I would just read you just a few lines about abolitionist feminism as this idea of uh, being simultaneously anti-racist and anti-misogynist. White anti-racist feminists can take the lead from our black and brown sisters and embrace an abolitionist stance towards chattel slavery and its racist and misogynist remains. Such an abolitionist feminist must commit to abolishing all forms of racial and sexual violence along with the hierarchies of economic class and heteropatriarchy in their white privileged forms. So that statement is trying to clarify what the, what the focus is, the place of sexual violence in the system of racial violence, the racial violence that is in the system of sexual violence. So abolitionist feminism focuses on end ending the heteropatriarchal capitalist racist police state. And we do in the US, um, for so many people in our communities, it does feel like a police state. You know, and I think you have to be inside it to fully know what, what, that, um, what that seems like. Now, um, so I'm back to, uh, to a, an understanding of the newest new of racism or massage noir to see the way that the othering of human bodies is done through color and racial coding along with sexual and gender hierarchies that are used by the class system. And understanding the, the role of white privilege in that. Now, I actually think that the problem of seeing white privilege is a problem that white people have that if you're not white, you can see white privilege all the time. And that that's, that's really the, the difficult political moment for some of us working in a society that still remains um, barely, but a, a white majority society. So some of my newest writing on racism is for the first time about white privilege and the way that white privilege is so normalized and naturalized that it is unseen and is invisible. But it's invisible to white people. It's not invisible from the eyes of someone who is not privileged in it. So a piece that I just wrote and was just, um, it's, it's on the web, it was just published, um, I think, when I was in the air on the way here. And um, it's called, and of course, just spending two days with me, I'm sure you'll be very warm to my title. And it's just called The, Every, the Everywhereness okay, of White Privilege. And then my subtitle is While Hiking. So I took a break, a little bit of a vacation. I thought it was a vacation. I thought I was going to just go brain numb given our election stuff and being asked to speak about it pretty often. And so uh, Richard and I uh, went and hiked uh, Glacier National Park, which is, have any of you been there? 
because I'd never been there. It's just one of the beautiful sites in, in um, Montana. I'd never been to Montana. And, um, and just, it's, um, it's a park that is, was filled with glaciers. Uh, the glaciers are melting. So even as I'm trying to just not think for a few days, all I see is climate change everywhere and it's denial. Um, but also all I see is white people. Not one person of color wherever we were hiking. Not one. So I started to think about the way that, how is this possible? We're hiking in Montana, in Glacier National Park, and everyone is white. And I don't think anyone's thinking about that. So I asked a couple of the people in charge, you know, who were running the different lodges, etc. I said, so is it always so white? And of, of course they're white, who, you know, and they say, excuse me? And I said, is it, is it always so white? And they said, what do you mean? And I said, the people, all the people are white. Is it always this way? And then I thought, I don't even need an answer. So then I was thinking about the fact of racism and how it operates. So there are lots of, it, the, okay, so I just have to tell you one other thing about the hike. So everyone is worried about the grizzly bears that are in the mountains there. And people kind of have bear spray in case a bear starts to come towards you. And uh, Richard, who is much more of a naturalist than I am, just said, if a bear, if a bear does appear, Zila, uh, don't run because you can't run faster than a bear. I thought that's good information. I did not know that. <laughs> I would have run. Um, he said, just um, drop down. Just do not seem like you are an aggressor. And I thought, well, that's easy. I can do that. I can drop down. No problem. So then as we're hiking, I'm thinking, maybe we don't belong here. You know, maybe, maybe this is not, you know, if this is bear country and they don't want us here, how come we're here? Which then just took me to, maybe black people know that they shouldn't be here. That everybody takes their space and they're not going to take theirs. And then it started to also make me think about um, maybe if when you walk out your door, you're really worried that you could be killed. And right now, that's really a high likelihood in some of our neighborhoods, in Chicago, Milwaukee. Maybe you don't go where you are looking, you know, in other words, you don't have to look for danger to make your life exciting you know, your life is already dangerous. So I started to, I, I wrote this piece because I said maybe what we have here is, you know, maybe the, some of these spaces that are, that are white in our society are white, you know, because for reasons of privileging and power and oppression that white people really need to think about and that we should not be allowed our white spaces that really have us not thinking and wondering uh, about the way that violence has been done. And um, the, the notion here again that white privilege to white people is a very silent thing. And um, there are groups now in the United States there is a group called Standing Up for Racial Justice. It is made up only of white people, and they operate in support of Black Lives Matter, saying that it is their responsibility to support Black Lives Matter without taking over a leadership role in the struggle against racism. So, um, uh, that is also a group that some of you might be interested in knowing more about. It's S-U-R-J is, um, is what you could just Google to 
get information. And I, I am a part of that group, but I also um, have issues with the complexity of the issue. I think that um, white people can't think that learning about racism is the same thing as fighting racism. So um, some people just seem to be spending too much time trying to learn what it is rather than standing against it. And then also I think it allows a safety space for white people um, because it still says that you are supporting the struggle without feeling as though you have responsibility to make sure it goes forward and that you are willing to be in danger in that. Mm -hmm.